Okay, it's great to uh, see the teams talking. Um, I'm hearing from the team in here some good discussion, and I was happy to see the other team uh, take advantage of the time here at the beginning of the class. Um, have both teams met with the stakeholder no. at this point? Uh, not yet? We have. No, we have. You, you have. Okay, awesome. Uh, we're going to be talking today about some material uh, germane to that that hopefully will inform future such meetings, um, help you with some tips to uh, get the most out of those meetings. Uh, the meetings are important. Um, and uh, as a reminder, you should be undertaking them at least once per incremental deliverable, right? Um, and ideally, you undertake them you know, just around the time of the incremental deliverable so they can actually see and give feedback on what you've achieved, right? Um, uh, each, each milestone, you can uh, get, get some understanding from them if their conception of the system has evolved, if their understanding of what the highest priority is has changed, uh, maybe because they're dealing with the stakeholder organizations you know, like EGATS, um, or maybe it's because of some uh, some rethinking about the size issues with the tablets. You should be able to have those discussions that show them, a, if not a demo of the system, at least some components of the functionality and get some feedback uh, from them. Um, now, uh, I've never typically come to these meetings with, with stakeholders. Um, if there's a compelling reason that you'd like me to, uh, to to try to intervene in some way, you should let me know. Um, if you do need me along for any reason, but that's comparatively my my contributions are normally in terms of reviewing the, the technical side of things. Um, okay, uh, just as a reminder as well, uh, I trust you're all prepared, but uh, right after this. In Thor 205A, we're having the incremental incremental deliverable zero presentation, right? This is basically like infrastructure, technology stack, uh, responsibilities within the team who's doing what. Um, and uh, that will will be based on you know presentation by you. It does it needn't include slides, but it slides are welcome in general. Um, and often they can be used to structure the presentation. Um, we do like to have all members of the team responsible for presenting at least once during the semester. I'm not going to keep tally on that. So I'm not going to use it as part of your participation, participation mark, you know, whether or not or the number of times you contributed. But in general, it's a good thing to, um, to ask people to present. Uh, and it helps ensure that people will be motivated to show up at the group meetings. Okay. Um, so uh, project managers, um, the two of you, I'd ask you to uh, let me know if you're seeing any attendance issues with, um, with those, you know, making it to the team meetings here at the beginning of class. Uh, or in terms of uh, not responding to emails regarding project needs. Um, this is the time you should be scouting out for it um, at the start uh, to hit off issues later. And there may be reasons that, you know, people you, we thought were taking the class or dropping it early on, um, but increasingly it carries a life of its own with um, some people being overwhelmed by other courses um or uh feeling more more awkward because they haven't been involved and that presents a barrier to getting involved and you want to be able to to navigate these issues so uh you can take advantage of everyone's energy okay so let me know of any attendance issues we do have ways of um trying to help with that as the course organizers um, but keeping an eye out for it now is really important. Don't let it just kind of pass by if someone's a wall for, you know, a week or something like that. Try to try to keep an, an aim on it. Okay, those are some announcements. Any questions from folks before we get into some lecture material? Yeah. Uh, can you maybe elaborate what's kind of expected for ID one? Sure. 
So I do one um, is the first, you know, substantive incremental deliverable, right? Um, and it should demonstrate real progress in terms of uh, a couple lines of, of things. Um, number one, it's got to demonstrate some understanding, something we'll be talking about today in space, namely requirement side. Like, you know, what are the major elements of the system you're putting together? Um, what's the workflow between them, right? Um, what are uh, some of the, the kind of major screens and and maybe wireframing that if, if I use the term wireframe to people have a sense of what I mean. Um, I mean just kind of a sketch maybe of of, of some of the, the major components of it um, or a listing of the elements of functionality. Um, you might also be uh, be including some description of, of a high level thinking about the design of the system. By say design, I mean like architecture, like overall. So if you're using a model view controller architecture, or you're making use of a, uh, you know, an approach based around Node.js that's using um, uh, Redux for state management, and uh, it's using React for for certain components with React Native. Um, and you're using uh, just that's part of the technology stack, but sometimes there's a plan in terms of state management that goes beyond just kind of what the technology is. It's kind of a more technical plan. So you should document that. that that's a very basic thing. But more than that, you should have gotten a lot further than that. Now I look for two, you know, two things. Number one, um, you may actually have a, a little bit of functionality um, created. Uh, maybe it's uh, login screens and uh, ability to create accounts. Um, maybe it's something you started on the admin side of the site, you know, because often you have the, the user experience and then you have an admin site. Um, maybe, uh, maybe you put in place, you know, some basic screens to add kids to the system, or you put in place some mechanisms that, um, uh, that allow um, kind of a home page display for a kid at risk. Um, I, I'm looking for some sort of um, bits of functionality there. Uh, I'd like to see first steps towards some of the highest priority or highest risk functionality. That would be good. Um, uh, possibly the, the sort of instantiation of the architecture that you'd be using to, to build the framework around. But a lot of what I've been looking for in ID1 that's different from later IDs is um, something that I mentioned up here on the board before. Uh, and it's something called a spike protocol. And I noted that we often use the term prototype to refer not only to kind of an early version of a system, but a throwaway version, sort of throwaway code. A, a prototype um, is often used to mean um, it's it's not merely the system at its earlier stages, but rather it's a mock. -up. It's not quite a mock up. It's a it's something which is trying things out, um, but in ways that won't be retained. And a spike prototype is something where you're actually focusing on a certain questions you're not sure about. Like maybe you're with React, you're not sure how it would interface with uh, the camera or certain sensors on the, this is the GPS system or what have you. Um, and a spike prototype will let you sort of try those bits of functionality out. Sometimes it's done for, um, for the purposes of risk management because you're not sure how two technologies will play well together. If they will play well together, they may conflict. They may not. They may not interact, um, you know, properly. And so, a spike prototype will allow you to sort of create code whose job in life it is to kind of investigate this issue, resolve this risk, you know, demonstrate how these technologies work together, show how, you know, just and synon and. Uh, and a coverage testing framework um, all play together 
to allow you to undertake testing and and mocking or what have you. So um, with the spike prototype, this is often where you'll gain a lot of the learning that will then go on to your items two, three, four, and five. And so when I say that, like I expect a contribution in terms of working code for item one, I don't just mean, you know, like the final functionality or for a given feature. It's not that I'm looking for a feature to be entirely created by ID1 necessarily, although that's great. I'm looking for running code that might that might serve spike prototype needs. So if you had three spike prototypes and you know a login screen and the ability to create accounts or what have you, that might be the sort of flavor I'd be looking for in ID1. Um, uh, if if you by contrast do feel you could roll out some trial features, um, you know, you're you're welcome to do so. But um, often it's a combination of features, of some architectural investment, and spike prototypes. So that's typically ID one, and it's a good question because it's coming up soon. So, so that's uh, by way of, of guidance. So spike prototypes often form that the basis of tutorials conducted in the team for others to learn how to work with the technology involved, right? They provide like, hey, this is how we're going to be able to do this key task or that key task. This is how we can use Redox uh, for state management and our React Native app to achieve um, this sort of workflow or what have you. And someone who takes the lead on the spike card type would then tutor, tutor the rest of the team. And that includes tutoring the devs, the developers, and tutoring the test team. Um, so the testers need to learn how it works so they can test it, bang at it, et cetera, whether through the UI or programmatically, and the devs uh, need to learn how to develop with it. So both of them are going to typically be uh, taught in tutorials how to use the system. Okay. Um, so, so this is uh, often a big part of my new one. Other questions? Okay. Um, so, I need one presentations. You could invite stakeholders or you may elect not to do so. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. Uh, typically, ID five, the final incremental deliverable, we do involve them. Um, often, the ID one is kind of on the technical side because it's sort of demonstrating how technologies work together. So often, they're not invited, but you know they might be invited for later IDs. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I see we have um, some folks online as well. I'm going to try to have the chat up here and switch back and forth a little bit. Uh, great. So I'm going to talk today about something that I'm hoping will be useful in the course of your project. I'm, I'm reworking the syllabus a little bit to reflect the technologies that you're, you're likely going to be undertaking in your, your mobile projects. Um, I want to talk today about requirements gathering. Um, so a requirement, probably how many, how many people have seen uh, a lecture on requirements gathering before as part of 370 or 270 or some other class? Requirement solicitation. I like to call it elicitation because gathering sounds like, you know, it's like a barrier you go around in tech. It's just waiting for the plate picking. Requirements elicitation gets a sense you've got to draw it out. You have to be, it's an active process to kind of um, like, you know, pumping up from a hand well or something. You gotta, you gotta pump it and sometimes you have to prime it and, and eventually the water comes out. So, um, you know, I, I think we're all aware at some level the requirements of criteria that has to be satisfied for successful project completion, right? It's, it's a criteria that needs to be met in order for this project to deliver the value looked for by the, the stakeholder. Um, 
And typically, you know, it's associated with a problem that's been solved. Um, and uh, Jerry Weinberg, in a series of books on quality software management, comment, likes to define it as it's an attempt. He, he likes to sort of embold these, these terms to indicate that they're each, you know, like really significant. It's an attempt because we often fail, uh, we often don't succeed or, or, or compromise at it to discover you've got to actually, you know, learn uh, in the process and, and really probe to learn effectively what products or what combination of features, functionality, non-functional requirements, et cetera, is, is desired by some stakeholders. Um, so they want some value from the system and there might be different sets of people. For example, there could be the police with Kira and, uh, and stakeholders are associated with that. But often there's gonna be additional users like you know, the end users of this, right? For the kids at risk. And those are two separate set of stakeholders. And hopefully they'll be aligned in their needs. Hopefully what you hear from one will help the other and they'll be aligned. But sometimes they're a bit different, right? Um, uh, what you may hear from Moshkaba could be a bit different from Hassan. And you may say, well, wait a minute, you know, Moshkaba works for Hassan, and they should sing the same tune. But the truth is, um, you know, maybe Moshkaba is involved in more of the actual deployment ins and outs, and Hassan may be arranging for them, but not as heavily involved. And Moshkaba may have a somewhat different idea of what he wants than Hassan. You gotta realize that like sometimes you may hear things from one stakeholder that might not be echoed by the other. And you gotta navigate that. Um, so why am I giving a lecture on something that sounds so basic? Well, first of all, you need to listen to them. And second of all, it's extremely important for project success and it's oddly hard. And it turns out that um, requirements problems are arguably the number one reason for problematic IT problems. People don't understand really what's needed or what's needed changes over time. Um, people put in place things that aren't needed or they don't put in place things that are needed or they attempt to deal with things that are needed but, but give something that, that is different, et cetera. And you really need a way of understanding what customers want. Um, and it sounds easy, but when you're dealing with nutritionists, or when you're dealing with people whose expertise is in, you know, um, uh, criminal psychology, or expertise is is at the level of um, street youth, the language may be different. The concepts may be different. They're when when they use the term, it's different from from how you use it, etc. Um, and it turns out that if you find things that are off in the requirement space. Um, it's far easier to, to fix them, whereas finding them in later phase, uh, phases is much more difficult. Um, so an issue found early uh, often requires very little change, and then over time it goes up, arguably exponentially, at least super linearly, so faster than, than any given long. Any given line you can draw, it's going to go up faster than it. It's going to rise up um, really quick. Why is this? It's actually pretty much exponential or geometric. It kind of doubles every, every so many months or what. Why do you think that is? Why do you think finding it early is so much cheaper? Yeah. Because you're not um, grandfathered into a certain architecture or something like that. That's right. If, if you make a mistake early on, like what's needed, um, it ends up being kind of baked into the system, right? So it ends up being, I like to use the term, ossified it. It ends up getting incorporated in a way that requires a rework. And the further you go along here, the more and more reworks required because the more and more been built on top of it, right? You have design elements or architectural elements put in place, low level design elements elements of code, tests that are built to test that code. And 
documentation and user user help systems or whatever and if there's a problem early on like an inconsistency between requirements that you only find late not only do you have to go back and fix the requirement you have to redo up in elements along here because elements of the design that captured all this have to be changed they have to be updated now suddenly we can't assume that the database will be pre-populated before we do this step or what have you or that will always be connected to the internet um, while we're undertaking the you know adding children to the system and and we've got to go through and sort of not only change change the requirement or change the architecture change the high level design change the low level design change the code change the test the dependent code and you gotta sort of wipe away the old stuff and reduce it and so it the amount of work rises geometrically or exponentially um and you know this has been found empirically in like real real world studies they found these things just pile on it's it's like a snowballing effect um and it turns out like if you have requirements all specked out from the start and you lose your code base um some studies have found like shocking it's shockingly easier to rebuild the system if you know precisely what you want to build it's shockingly easier because there's so much work that goes into iterating and trying to figure it out um and requirements affect a whole bunch of things they, they affect the ability to you know find the right customer who will benefit from your your, your tools and and the degree to which that customer feels they're getting quality product um, the effectiveness of development you're not waiting around for clarity on an issue um the ability to find faults early uh because you're clear about exactly how it should handle a disconnection from uh from the network or what have you and and the ability to maintain the product and all this leads to kind of efficiency by not having to throw things away non-redundancy non in development higher quality higher development speed and higher higher efficiency in that development um so requirements like really nailing requirements helps on all three elements of what's called the iron triangle are you folks familiar with the iron triangle Anyone tell me what are the vertices of the iron triangle? Trying to draw that isosceles triangle. Um, iron triangle. Anyone know what it is? Three, three vertices, three corners. Yep. Uh, time. Yep. Time. Money. Money. Quality. Yeah. Quality, and, and sometimes people put in here instead value um which includes sort of quality and and, and functionality and features delivered uh, but i would argue that's part of quality um if quality determines value maybe it's almost uh defined as things that deliver value and the idea is look in an iron triangle it's really easy to get two out of the three if 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 I give you two and you have no constraints on the third, you're not gonna have that hard of trouble uh, delivering it. Um, if I give you, and you know, if I need it done in um, in a certain amount of time uh, and within a certain budget, and I don't care about the quality, <laughs> right? Uh, it'll be. Well, I, I can't say aloud what it will be, but it, it won't be very good, right? Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, if if I don't care about the time, but I really need it, and it was in a certain budget and with a certain quality, but it can take you as long as you want. Well, you could do something. Um, you could work on the spare time over the course of years and deliver me something. And the same thing with with uh, budget. Uh, uh, it it could be something that uh, that you could fit within. So the idea is you can get two out of the three. Um, one out of three is, is really easy to get if you don't care about the other two. If you're fixed on two, you can still do it by dropping the third. If you need all three, that's hard. If you need to do it within a certain amount of time, certain dollars, at a certain quality, 
That's the trick. That's the rub. Um, and it turns out that requirements, good requirements help all of these. They avoid redundant development. They avoid lowering both cost and time. They allow debugging to be easier. They make the product quicker to, to develop. And it delivers value because it delivers on the requirements, the things that are needed. Um, okay. Uh, and it turns out it lowers project risk. It allows for faults to be captured earlier and lots of other good things that uh, because of time, I don't have time to go into. But um, generally it's, it's something which um, confers value across the spectrum of issues. You know, other types of things we do often will compromise one of these by, by giving us uh, some freedom in the others. Um, they'll impose load on the dollars by giving us the tools that will help us with quality and value, or they'll cost time, but let us do it for cheaper and quality, but requirements help all three. So what the, what's the problem with requirements? Well, these are some of the biggest ones. Requirements capturing this up and incomplete. It's ambiguous. Like when we take down something and the team reads it and say, yeah, I understand what's going on. But different members of the team have totally different understanding. And they go off and kind of do their thing. And only when they discover they're trying to bring them together, wait a minute, I, I didn't think that was needed. They did think it was needed. And, and now we have confusing, you know, um, confusing situation within the system. Um, uh, there's cases where you're talking to the stakeholder, uh, the end user, and you you don't actually pick up on something they say, or you don't understand that they're using the word in a technical sense uh, of their field, and, and you understand it in a colloquial sense, uh, since you're a computer scientist and you don't know what the term means, and you end up you know, capturing the requirement wrong. Or you forget, you, you, know, you only write it down later and you forget it. Um, a conflict, there could be conflicting requirements, like a, a disagreement between requirements. Maybe they came from two different people, that's different origins, but maybe it's just a logical, a logical inconsistency. These things occur. I've worked on a lot of systems in my time, and sometimes you think you have a really good understanding, but you really haven't thought it through. You haven't, you know, crushed it down and really understood it in, in the ins and outs. And there's a subtle conflict between two things. Um, you have issues there of different priorities. Some are really high priority, some are low, uh, lower. Sometimes developers, this is quite common, developers can cut ideas. They want to get their idea in there because they think it's cool. Oh, come on, we can we can do this. You know, we'll insert this, this ability. I've always wanted to work with that sort of device or what have you. And developers like to kind of do, um, they think they have a really neat idea to add. And sometimes, the stakeholder is delighted, that's great. But sometimes it's not a stakeholder interest, but developers put it in there because they think it will be good and the stakeholders don't know necessarily what to make of it and why time is being spent on it. And finally, they can be unnecessarily specific, which hinders the development of the system. So I wanna make a distinction here between two types of requirements broadly. Number one, functional requirements. And number two, non-functional requirements. Anyone want to tell me what's the difference between a functional requirement and a non-functional Give me, give me a sense of uh, an example of a functional requirement. Anyone? I thought I saw a hand, but yeah. So like as for our project, the functional requirement getting the application should be able to take pictures, record data Good. that will be functional. Yeah. And yeah. a non-functional requirement can be uh, it can like be installed to a different uh, app like um, iOS. So like we can get it on iOS or Android. So I guess that Good. would be non-functional requirement. Yeah, that's that both those are are good starts on it, I think. Um, so a functional requirement will involve you know, capabilities, functionality of the system, right? Um, these could be use cases. Um, and 
often it's features of the system, what it can be used to, to do. A non-functional requirement is something that, that isn't involving the behavior of the system, but is essential for the system. An example of this might be um, memory, you know, it has to stay within a certain memory footprint, for example, or it has to be, it has to, and you could argue that this is somewhat behavior and aspect behavior, it has to execute with a certain performance or a certain uptime, right? Or a certain security level or availability level or what have you. These are all examples of non-functional requirements. It's not about the features, it's about other aspects of the system. Um, and you said like what platforms it runs on. That's exactly right. Um, uh, it, it's something about its, its underpinnings that's needed often to deliver on the functional requirements, but it's, it's not per se having to do with um, the requirements, uh, the, the features themselves. Now, one of the things that I mentioned last time, I think it was, but I want to emphasize is most requirements are not, in fact, customer requirements. There are things that kind of flow from custom requirements logically because we understand the technological trade-offs. Um, often these are things related to the how we're going to accomplish a system. So, um, you know, in, in your case, uh, look, uh, Hassan doesn't care uh, whether this thing is on Flutter or PWA, Progressive Web Apps, or React Native. For all he can care, it could be on Apache Cordova. Um, uh, what he cares about is that it's a, um, it runs on iOS and Android, right? I mean, as far as he's concerned, you could write it two native code bases, one for each of them. He doesn't care, that's, that's, that's up to you. You've got to deliver it on, you know, in your mind, you're probably thinking it would be nuts to, to undertake two separate parallel native applications for this um, when there's good, when there's good cross-platform support. So we need to run it with, you know, one of these platforms. And maybe these platforms only work with versions of iOS and Android later than a certain thing. So, it's not Hassan who's saying it has to be with at least iOS 6 or whatever. It's because you want to use React Native and React Native Babel support is only available for iOS 7 and above or whatever, 6 and above. That's a derived requirement. It's not coming from Hassan. It's coming from your need to address some of Hassan's constraints given the limits of the technology that are available, right? Another example is maybe I don't know. Um, maybe you need to run a certain image processing on your application. And to do that realistically, you need a phone that is a certain support for, for you know, computational processing. Maybe it has to have a GPU on board or something like that. And there's only certain OSs that support versions of OS that support that. Um, so you need to make use of that, or maybe it requires code written in CUDA, which requires you know certain development tools and a certain type of code base, etc. Um, so derived requirements are not coming from the user. You won't hear them from the user, but what the user says, combined with your knowledge of the technologies, will tell you we need to have something like this, and need to capture those requirements because uh, someone coming to it. Ooh, Oh my God. Um, well, ain't that something? Um, uh, what? Um, okay. Uh, mumble. Um, I am not sure what happened uh, there, but um, uh, the comment was here. So some 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 um, slide got mangled. Um, so. Um, we're undertaking agile development purposes, you said, of course. And time was that um, software projects were typically undertaken what is these days called a waterfall model. Do you, do you 
folks encounter that in 370 and so on. Um, and the waterfall approach is often, it's a little bit like the, the straw dog that people like to burn in effigy or something like that. Uh, you know, they, they like to, to criticize the waterfall model. But the waterfall model, um, legitimately speaking, um, it, it uh, sought to, to uh, undertake a systematic process to produce uh, larger scale software. Um, but it had a lot of issues with it. Um, and a lot of them were associated with its long development times, long time for design and requirements gathering to delivery, and a lot of stakeholder requirements changed during that time. Um, but one of the things that was most key early on with the waterfall model was requirements gathering early on, because you, you do a systematic attempt to learn the requirements because the user was not going to see that system for another nine months or whatever. And you sure as heck have got to be sure about what they want, because if you come nine months from now and show them the, the system and they say, that isn't what I asked for, you want to be able to say, yes, it is. Look, here's the document you agreed to, right? Um, and so there was a real uh, attempt to kind of um, capture requirements in a way that was very rigorous. Now, in today's software development, we have small, we have much quicker cycles of agile development. And, you know, the natural question comes up, do we need requirements documents in this case? Do we, do we really need requirements if we're going to um, deal in a lightweight way with the stakeholder, meet with them uh, frequently, you know, every two weeks or something, get an understanding of what's needed, and, and sprint for it and deliver them and show it to them. Do we really need to write this all down? And those who've been working in the Agile area um, differ on this, but there's a school of thought and, and um, software development in Toronto and Alice Toth has done, has done a really good job, I think, articulating this. Um, so uh, writing up Agile requirements. Um, and there's about five elements to agile requirements. Um, just sort of rattling these off off the top of my head. Um, that's what got mangled. Uh, so one of them is, is use cases. Okay, um, coming up with use cases. Did you see use cases in the context of 370 or 270? Sort of characterizing actors and their interaction with the system undertaking activities in the system yeah okay so one thing is use cases another thing is is um is sort of uh use uh user workflow so these would be sort of the logical steps between um pages or screens of your application right um so how do Look, your application is not just a, a jumble of screens, a heap of screens, right? There's some logical length. You do this, and then you do that. You select a daycare, and that allows you to put the child in the daycare, right? Um, or you log in as a user um, who's a child at risk, and it knows you've already gone through the, the risk questionnaire before, so it doesn't ask you about it. But if you're the first time logged in, you go through the risk questionnaire. So that's kind of a staging, right, associated with that. Um, another component associated with this is, uh, is uh, sort of, uh, I'm going to say, uh, wireframes. Um, and wireframes often involve sketching up the elements of the workflow so pages screens etc in a rough way a schematic way right so sketching them out uh and beyond wireframes um we have uh what i call uh detailed uh detailed requirements on particular screens and and, and uh validation functionality etc so this would be sort of um screen or page specific. Um, uh, so, you know, listing of those components. Um, and I'm probably missing one thing here, but these are our four major elements occur 
kind of what's needed for an agile requirements document to capture um, some picture of this coming out. Why do you need that? Like, why do you need that for a two week sprint or a three week sprint? Why don't you need something like this? Why do I need that? Why don't you just keep it in your heads? Yeah, Laura said. Uh, your head is volatile and you have key factors that you want to write down. Yeah, your head is volatile and your head is opaque. At least most heads are. Uh, and, uh, and so most people on your team probably weren't there with the meeting with the stakeholder, right? And they haven't gone that long to bed. The stakeholder doesn't know what went into your head. And Across the team, there's got to be some knowledge of this because the testers have to be prepared for this. The devs have to be prepared for this so that they know what they're making, right? Um, they need to know something about the detail requirements, like the work, the, the, the validation that's going on in a page, the interrelationship between widgets and a page, and all that sort of stuff. The devs and the testers need to know about that. And if it's all just in someone's head, what's in my head may be different from what's in your head. We were both at the meeting and we heard different things. So it's worth sketching this down. And, and the goal is not to, to you know, um, have perfection. The, the idea is to capture it so you can communicate it across the right? um, It's a pragmatic thing. You, you want to make sure you're not doing something crazy where one person is working, is rowing in a different direction than another, or they're creating, you know, um, something that wasn't needed and wasn't requested they misunderstood something so of these components use cases are some of the most important and you know really these are matters of, of telling a story focusing on the user's uh, goals and um you know it can be really good for for communicating cases where the user is interacting with the system and it can make you think about things not captured in the in the system um for example which aren't captured in the um in the pre and so on uh where use cases tend not to work so well is you know if you have algorithmic details that are required for example um that really go into the details of what the user gets back from say a, a search on the system or what have you um and uh, you know, if they're the only description of the functionality, it's probably not going to work or work that well. And if it's not user facing, if it's based on non functional requirements, it's it's also not going to be uh, as effective. Now, something that I had talked with you about um, two times ago or three times ago was this di this kind of dialectic that occurs between you and a stakeholder when you go together. Because the issue is. Um, there's gaps, misunderstandings, blind spots on both sides. The client, be it Kira or be it Moshtaba or be it Hassan, you know, they may not be able to clearly envision the solution. I think Moshtaba and Hassan, because there's a previous version of the system, they have a bit of a glimpse, you know, of, of what they want. A better glimpse, perhaps, than Kira does because she hasn't seen a system that does this before. But they're still not going to be totally clear on, on how it all fits together when you create it. Um, uh, they often can't immediately communicate their domain understanding. So, like, there's a whole world for, um, you know, that's experienced differently by kids at risk than what we experienced. Um, some of us may have touched that world at times. But there's a whole set of issues that come in when kids are at risk of running, when um, you know they're dealing with uh, potential gang-related um, uh, affiliations, when they're dealing with police, when they're dealing with uh, uh, different relationships and potentially people that are that are have in mind exploitation, and um, you know someone that's an expert in this area, like Kira, who works in that area. It's going to have a hard time getting you that understanding. Um, Hassan and Moshkaba are going to have some hard times getting you a, an understanding. Um, and so they're going to be having trouble communicating this. But they're not going to be, especially not going to be aware of what's feasible with tech, today's technology. 
Often stakeholders are thinking two generations of technology ago. They're thinking what they've seen before, and that's often far before what, what's available today. Um, and so they don't understand the technology implications of steps. This is, this is a big issue because they may ask for some functionality and that functionality is, is going to cause you headaches because you're not sure how you're going to capture it. It's going to cause all sorts of issues, but they don't, they don't recognize that, right? And for them, maybe I could get feature X or feature Y. They're equally good for them. Feature X is going to cause you big headaches. Feature Y is not. They're not going to know that. The technical team, your side, is also in the dark about a lot of things. You know, you don't understand the domain that well. Um, you don't understand the language by which it's described, and sometimes even the concepts there. Um, you know, you don't, you don't perhaps have a good understanding of what's in place now compared to what could be in place. Like the children at risk, uh, there's probably websites that they can go to or Facebook groups that they're associated with that provide some information. And you're probably not familiar with that. For Hassan and um, Moshtaba's needs, there may be some systems in place which would provide them some ability to undertake the data collection, but you're not sure what that is and the gap between what that is and, and today's situation. Um, and even you have trouble you know, envisioning the solution clearly or parsing the domain language. Um, okay, let's talk about functional requirements and capturing functional requirements. Um, so functional requirements are traditionally written in a style that is very specific. Um, and an example here is shown. The patron shall be order, able to reorder any meal he or she has ordered within the previous six months, provided that all food items in that order are available on the menu for the meal date. Um, there's a lot packed in there. Um, you know, however, it's saying, you know, some user type, it's a functional requirement, it's aimed at the user, it's aimed at a feature, shall be able to do X or, um, you know, can't, you know, is prevented from doing Y or what have you, but it's, if there's some results associated with it, and often it shall, um, doing it to something, and then some qualifier under what conditions it's occur. You know, um, uh, able to reorder any meal he or she had ordered in the past six months, provided that all food items in that order, there's the provided, the qualifier, uh, are available on the, on the, uh, the menu for the meal date. Um, and, uh, and that qualifier makes it more specific. Um, and use cases can be valuable for many of these um, to kind of give that sense of what they can do, but this is often more specific. Um, and sometimes uh, they're written from the user's perspective, you know, condition or the system's perspective, conditions, under what conditions this will be triggered. For example, under what conditions the system would upload data, the collected data on the menu, on the, um, the plate weight study under what conditions that would be uploaded to the, to the server um, or under what conditions that child will be alerted or the under what conditions EGADs or other stakeholders would be alerted to the message in a bottle that that child had left earlier, you know, to indicate their whereabouts if they were in trouble, right? Um, Okay, I've given a bunch of requirement examples here. I'm not going to read them to you, but these are from requirements documents, um, and you might find them interesting as as examples um, for this. Okay, so I want to give you some concrete tips that will help. You. These tips should help you when you're meeting with these stakeholders. Number one, when you hear something from a stakeholder, repeat it. Why would you do that? Why do I say repeat it? Why would you repeat what you hear from the stakeholder? Yeah. Make sure you heard it right. Your name? Mark. Mark. Yeah. Mark's exactly right. So repeating it in different words, hopefully. Don't just say exactly what they said. At least that could prevent you. Make sure you didn't mishear them. But but it's better if you use different words. You paraphrase it. You state it differently. 
if they use very specialized words and you just parrot it back to them, you're not going to know that that word means something very specific to them because you're just regurgitating. But if you rephrase it, they'll say, no, 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 actually, I was using this word in this way, you know, um, and they'll correct it. So repeat things back. And really, it's best if you can have at least two people there because they may hear different things. You know, each may hear it a little bit differently, and that's valuable. Go over what you've heard right afterwards. Um, and another trick you might use is ask the stakeholder to repeat it, in other words. So that, again, is a double check that you've heard it properly. Um, and if, if they're doing it in different words, to make sure they're not using a term of art, a, a sort of a word that's used in, in a very, very specific way. Um, here's the thing. Requirements documents for you should be living documents, meaning it's not that you're creating them at the beginning of the waterfall and they are immutable, like, you know, platonic solids all through here, like the platonic sphere or the platonic you know, cube or something like that. Um, th these things are living documents in an agile process. They're evolving. Why are they evolving in agile? You could tell me. Kind of a low, low ball question. Yeah. Um, requirements have changed. Requirements have changed. And they change all the time in, 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 uh, in, the, in an agile system. Lead, right? Yeah. And, and why do they change? Why do requirements change? Um, the stakeholder might change their mind when they actually see it in action. Stakeholder changes their mind because they see it and they say, oh, oh, actually, I didn't mean that. What's another reason it might change? Well, you already did. You already put in place uh, the basic thing. And they say, oh, you've gotten that far by IP3? That's awesome. Let's have you extend this. Or they get excited by what they see and they say, you know, it would be really cool if I didn't think we'd have time, but let's layer this in there. And that will change what the need was. It will refine it, maybe. It will allow it to work offline and not just online or whatever. Um, so that's another reason. What's another reason they might change, requirements change? Well, there could be meetings between stakeholders where they hash things out and they've decided actually it needs to change. Um, uh, EGADs can meet with Kira and they discover it needs to change. Uh, maybe Hassan and Moshtaba during the semester go to a different sort of daycare and they discover, oh man, you know, all the kids there, I don't know, oh, I forgot, I'm having trouble imagining, you know, they, uh, all they do is they use sippy cups all day and we have to have a way of dealing with sippy cups is better or something like that. Um, and, and so their needs change. Um, organizations merge, you know, you're working for a bank and two banks merge and their processes change. So the requirements document for waterfall model attempted to be platonic solids. But what there is actually is, is put into place because often, if this was a nine month project, guess what? It would change. It would be, in fact, it's more likely to change than in two weeks, right? This is one of the advantages of Agile. You sprint forward, and it's a lot less likely to change in two weeks due to some big change of the client than in nine months. And so, how do they handle that? They have what's called a, a change control process. Um, and basically, this was a process by which the stakeholder could say, uh, I need those requirements changed. And the, the developers could say, uh, we've already started on that. This is going to cost you. We're kind of out here. And so we're going to have to redo a lot of work. And guess what? This goes from nine months to 12 months, right? Because you got to redo all this work and, and so on. So that's one of the problems with with uh, with waterfall model. Um, changing requirements would lead to a uh, 
uh, in the, the longer projects led to more risk of changes to requirements, which would lead to longer projects yet, and it would spiral. Uh, I saw projects die because of that. Um, so in your case, these should be living documents. Um, requirements traceability. Here's the deal. Um, the reason this grows is because more and more depends on it, right? We said to fix a thing early, to fix a, a problem early in requirements phase is a lot easier than fixing it later because a lot of things depend on that, right? A requirement is off. Your understanding was this doesn't have to work offline. The, the stakeholder, it turns out later, so what, what, what do you mean? You have to be online. Um, of course, you're you're going to be on Wi-Fi, right? Um, you say, uh, uh, no. Um, and and a lot of things depended on it. And the point is, there's a lot of things which depend on requirements, design, re uh, tests, code, etc. Sometimes reviews of these documents, um, architecture, and and the deal is, if you have requirements change. It, it's going to impact these things. So there are code, elements of code that are tied up with this requirement. There's elements of tests that test that code that are tied up with the requirements. Elements of design that are, are, are captured by that code that are tied up with these requirements. And um, it's a good practice if you can say what things depend on what requirements. Um, uh, that's, that's great. It, it, it's called traceability. And it allows you if requirement changes to go and figure out well, what do we need to change. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really push this issue here, but in some projects it's actually really, really important, particularly if there's a requirement that may change. If you hear, here's the thing: if you hear from the use from the stakeholder that a requirement is uncertain and might evolve, they're not sure about this, they'd like you to try it this way, but it may change, then you really want to trust. You know, keep track of what depends on it because you know it's just right for changing and you want to be able to you know act quickly right um prioritize it make it make it clear from the stakeholder which of these requirements are highest priority which 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 of these really matter the most which would you like to get first in hand that will inform your id one two three four five because you can focus on things that are higher priority. It's not the only thing, right? You might want to put in place things that are built on by other things, et cetera, but it's a good reason. Um, there should be acceptance tests around requirements. Oh, yeah, that's what I forgot here. Right there. Um, so there, there are use case acceptance tests as part of um, POS, uh, Cost hierarchy here or agile requirements. So these are tests that test these use cases that sort of validate them. Um, it, it's actually criteria that can be tested to verify that they're that they're um, that under this condition this should happen. Um, and you can you can test it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Avoid ambiguous words, read requirements over to make sure the words aren't ambiguous. Last versus previous is a terrible one. Last in English can either mean the final one in a list or it can mean the previous one. Um, and it can be terrible um, if you're dealing with sequences and you're using those terms. Um, right. Um, uh, let's see, I think. We're just running out of time here. Um, here's some non-functional requirements. Um, remind me your name. Uh, Shantri. Yes. Um, so uh, who's exactly Shantri? Who's exactly right? Um, non-functional requirements uh, are dealing with things other than, than features. And here are some of them. Right, memory footprint, platform limitations, just like you said, uh, the reliability of the system, the portability of the system, the ability to to move it easily over to another system or the performance of uh, reusability. You want to be able to reuse this in other environments. Uh, robustness to error, right? User error. Guess what, folks? We can't just handle a software developer's correct user input. 
we have to handle all sorts of horrible user input. User input in the wrong, wrong language, wrong natural language, uh, uh, disconnection uh, at the wrong times, cases where you know uh, too long a string is put in. Um, we have to be able to handle all sorts of error, potentially malicious uh, issues as well. Um, okay. Um, so requirements can have acceptance tests as you with these. We talked about this before. System tests are often with high level design unit tests for coding, et cetera. Um, okay. One of the foremost types of error here is a missing requirement. If you go over your list of requirements, you should have in mind spotting ambiguity, spotting things that aren't clear, et cetera. All that's good. But one of the key things you want to watch out for is um, missing requirements. So these can come about in two ways. Number one, the user doesn't care about it. Number, a second way this can come about is that users care really strongly about and assume you know it. So they don't even mention it. Of course, it has to work offline. Of course, you know, where we work, there's often no connections. Kids who run are often, you know, uh, way off grid or what have you. They just assume you know. Everyone knows that. So they're not going to tell you. It's so obvious and so important, they don't share it. But it could also be they don't care about it. Um, you need to distinguish between this. So be sure to probe. This is why it's Requirements elicitation. It's not the gathering in some passive way. It's elicitation. Okay. Um, and another thing is, you know, you may observe, uh, you may mishear the statement, have two people or more, and you may have recalled. You, you misrecall it from later. Write it down quickly afterwards, or use a Google Doc during it and have multiple people coordinating around the Google Doc. Um, another thing is, people often neglect non-functional requirements in many areas. So be sure to put them in. Um, be sure to, Shanti uh, had pointed out, you know, there's all these types of requirements here that are non-functional and you should be sure to think about them. And when you describe your requirements document, I'd love to see. Okay, um, I think that's all we'll, we'll cover for today. Um, take a look at those tips um, uh, and try to keep these things in mind. Go with multiple people in the stakeholder, repeat things that you've heard, ask them to repeat them in different words. Make sure that you're using uh, documentation of it that captures it quickly in a less ambiguous way. Look for missing requirements, ask them about prioritization of requirements, etc. Okay, so learn from that. I will see you in 10 minutes in 205 N, right? And we'll give some presentations. Thank you.